we have everyone, I mean, as uh, Emma, if you want, you can go ahead and start um, as people arrive, you can just let them into the waiting room, but we are going to formally start the event now. Um, and so we're going to begin with Ryan Wheeler and uh, then kind of move on to other things that we have planned. So thank you for everyone for being here. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Ryan Wheeler. I'm the director of the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology uh, at Phillips Academy. Um, so for those of you who aren't part of um, the Phillips Academy uh, community, uh, we'd like to welcome you all. Um, I'd also like to make a, um, and of course, welcome to all of those of you who are part of the Phillips Academy community. We're delighted that you uh, joined us. Um, we're really excited about Ramson's talk this evening, and really it's a fairly, I think, informal conversation uh, dialogue, so you'll have lots of opportunities to ask questions and talk with Ramson. Um, I do want to make a, um, uh, uh, an Indigenous land acknowledgement. Uh, it's uh, something that we started doing at the Peabody Institute a few years ago, and Happily, Phillips Academy is starting on the process of uh, developing a formal uh, acknowledgement for the school. Uh, and so I'm on the little working group for that. And so I'm, I'm tasked with researching um, the native history of Andover, which is incredibly complicated, uh, not only because of uh, what happened to native people uh, in terms of disease and destruction uh, in the face of the coming of Europeans, but also in terms of um, just the, the, the complexities and, and intricacies of the way that they were organized and the fact that as uh, Europeans, we want them to be in these nice, well-defined territories, but that's not how they were. Uh, and they um, made all kinds of fascinating alliances based on economics and marriage relationships that um, became part of their histories and then changed um, and some of the names of the people that lived in uh, Andover are Penacook and Pawtucket and Almuchiqua. Uh, and today, of course, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, we acknowledge the contemporary native people, the Abenaki, uh, the Nipmuc and Wampanoag. Uh, and, and so we uh, have to acknowledge the truly atrocious things that happened to uh, native people with the coming of Europeans uh, and take responsibility for understanding that history and making things uh, different, uh, working towards healing uh, whenever we can. So with that um, uh, short acknowledgement, I'm, I'm happy to uh, turn things over to Ramson, who's going to introduce himself. Okay. Hey, everybody. Good evening. I'm glad to uh, be here in, in your company. Um, my name is Ramson Lamatawaima. I'm a member of the Hopi tribe in northeastern Arizona. And um, gee, I, you know, I don't know where to start. Uh, uh, next week, I'll be turning 67 years old. Um, and I'm looking forward to that, you know, uh, because uh, that's probably about half of my life that I've lived so far. Uh, I'm a glass blower primarily, but my uh, professional background is in education. Um, my teaching experience ranges from kindergarten all the way up through the college level. So I did teach sociology for about 13 years at uh, North Central College in Naperville, Illinois. Uh, and uh, I just kind of hung up my guns there and got into the glass blowing studio. Um, but uh, I've also delved into stained glass art. Uh, I'm really interested in learning how to fuse glass as well. Uh, so the majority of my life right now is very artistic. Uh, written about four books of poetry so far. And I kind of put that on the back burner. And uh, so today I just like to have fun, you know, wake up every day, I'm just grateful to, to be alive. Um, and I just love to share ideas. So uh, when I was teaching um, 
junior high school through the college level, I pretty much had a fairly loose agreement with my students. And I didn't really refer to anyone as a student. I referred to people as my colleagues. Uh, the only thing is that I have a little bit more life experience than you do. That's, that's the separator right there. So with, with the classes that I teach, I just say, look, um, I can't teach you anything. The best I can do is to help you to learn. So part of the responsibility of learning falls upon you. And uh, I always welcome questions. I'd rather talk uh, with you than to talk to you. And you're certainly welcome to disagree with me on some points. Okay, so um, should we start in with the uh, video there? Give people an idea of the type of things that I do. My name is Ramson Lomatoima. I'm a member of the Hopi tribe and I was born into the Eagle clan. And uh, I live here in Hodvella, Arizona on the Hopi reservation. I'm a glass blower. I'm a published poet and I'm a kachina doll carver, not necessarily in that order. My professional training is in education. Now, when you consider glass blowing, uh, which is the class that I teach, you see a number of, of tools here. You see equipment here that are totally foreign to Ho Hopi culture. So there's no word for certain things. And so this becomes the challenge for me. What vocabulary could I develop in the Hopi language uh, whereby we could blow glass, which is a totally non-traditional foreign medium, but still use the language to communicate. I look to Kachinas to give me uh, ideas to, to put into glass so that I can share uh, the visions of the spirit of life, but also the visions of what it is to bring into fruition something that's deep inside of you. Kachinas, in a general sense, uh, are the spirit aspects of uh, the Hopi reality. And when I talk about the Hopi reality, I'm talking about the environment. When we talk about Kachina spirits, we're talking about the spirit aspects of everyday objects things that we have in the human experience when we talk about Hopi, uh, the plants, the birds, the insects, those natural forces, the clouds, the moon, the stars, all of these have a spirit quality or a spirit essence. And so these are the Kachinas. How we look at things culturally is uh, we work glass just as a, a potter would work the clay or a farmer works the field. We work the glass. We're transforming it for the benefit of someone else. Well, there you have it. So What's the first question? Well, I was going to start with one um, that I had been thinking about. I've been thinking about for a while as I looked at your work um, and as I've looked at your work over the years. Um, I just wanted to, you to think about, so how do you incorporate your Hopi identity into your artwork, in your opinion? I think um, there are several ways that I do it. Uh, one is from the inside, you know, your heart uh, guides you in a lot of the things that we choose to pursue. Uh, what establishes our values for us, you know, some of it is learned, but I believe that everyone is born a creative person. Uh, so 
I identify myself primarily as someone who creates uh, for the benefit of others. Um, and I think a large part of it is, is cultural as well. Um, in, in the Hopi culture, we view people who are creative as people who heal. Because uh, when we look at the world from the Hopi perspective, uh, the world is full of pain. It's uh, full of a lot of positive things, but it, there's also things that um, we could say fall into that category of uh, ill feeling. Uh, some of this um, comes from our environment. Uh, some of it comes from culture. Uh, there are different sources for pain. And so the job of an artist in terms of our culture is that we are here, here to help to alleviate that pain. So the beauty that we create, whether it's a poem or painting, a song, doesn't matter what it is. If, if that touches someone, if someone... Um, it, you know, if someone smiles from it, if they connect with it, then you've allevi alleviated a little bit of their pain. So this is why we have beauty in our world, so that uh, every person here can share their life with other people by helping them to alleviate some of that pain that each and every was each and every one of us carry, uh, because. Uh, that's a, you know, pain is a universal, you know, we all have it. We all go through life with it. Some of us with uh, a higher degree of it than others, but nonetheless, uh, we all deal with pain in one way or another. And the job of the artist is to help to heal other people. Ramson, we have a question from uh, Heather Lucas, who's um, uh, one of our uh, advisory committee members at the Peabody. And she's, uh, she asks, what's the process you have evolved for determining Hopi words to describe tools and elements of glass blowing? Oh, it's actually Aiden uh, Lucas is asking the question. Uh, the process... Um, involves several things. Number one, uh, I think the bottom line for coming up with new words with, uh, with glass blowing tools and processes and uh, functions and things like that falls down to one's reality. Uh, because um, one of my favorite people, one of my heroes in my life is a gentleman by the name of Joseph Campbell who wrote uh, a good amount of books on mythology. And um, I took um, a quote from, from him one time to talk about the place of myth in different societies. Uh, so when I was teaching at North Central College, one of the questions that I would pose to my colleagues there would be, give me your definition of a myth. And most people would respond with, well, it's a story or a legend that has some kind of truth to it, but it really didn't happen. Um, and that's kind of, that's to me is about 90% of the response that I get from, from a lot of people. Uh, so I say, okay, so let's maybe change this up just a little bit. And uh, I tell them about Joseph Campbell and how he defines a myth. So Joseph Campbell defines a myth as a statement of one's reality. So the myths that I grew up in my culture and my tribe makes the world real for me. It doesn't have to make it real for anyone else. So once you've, once you've had that myth ingrained, whatever it may be, uh, because there are a lot of them out, out there in the world, is, is the starting point for approaching life in different ways. So for me, 
um, one of the things about approaching life in my reality is that I come from a culture that approaches life in terms of Martin Buber's um, idea of relationships. So Martin Buber uh, talks about different types of relationships that people have with themselves, with other people and their world. And basically uh, you've got two different ones. You live in a world of I, it, or you live in a world of I, thou. So in an I, it society, you, you look at the world, at your environment, at, at different things that you encounter in life as not having any life to it. So it's an object, it's a thing. Uh, whereas in an animistic culture, the kind that I grew up in, we look at the world and our environment uh, as being alive. So I have, a connection with everything. I have a connection with the glass. I have a connection with the tool. And this is a relationship that I have. So to me, the glass just isn't, it just isn't a thing that you manipulate. You have a relationship with the molten glass as you're shaping it because it's a thou. You have a relationship with the glass. So in our culture, anything that I produce in terms of art or a poem or a song, we say is my child because I brought it into fruition. I brought it into this world. So that's basically the process that, that I look to in terms of uh, developing this art form within our culture specifically. Yes. Is that Eliza? Am I correct? Yeah, you're right. It's Eliza. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I was wondering how you like discovered glass blowing and why you chose to like continue with it as like an art form. Oh man, uh, who likes a good story? Anybody like stories in the group? <laughs> cool. So uh, a lot of years ago. Um, I was doing some consulting work for a museum, museum in Corning, New York. Uh, and uh, I went up there to uh, help with their collections because they had a lot of materials from the Hopi culture and they really didn't know what they had in their collections. So I went up there with the intent of helping them to recatalog and to provide better documentation for all the, the Hopi stuff that they had. Well, unfortunately, uh, there was this big weather thing that happened up there. Uh, the, their collections got water damaged. So by the time I got up there, we, we really couldn't look through this stuff. We, you know, it was, it was just too far damaged to do any work on that, to do any cataloging. Uh, so I did a couple of public programs for them, visited a couple of schools, and with the free time I had, I went to the Corning Glassworks right across the river. And I had seen glass blowing done before, but uh, this was a totally different experience for me. So I went in there, and if you can imagine a room that's bigger than a gymnasium, uh, that was, you know, two stories tall, and that's how high the ceiling was, and a set of bleachers off to uh, one wall, and in the center of the basketball court, you might say, uh, was this huge furnace, and encircling this brick furnace were teams of glass blowers, and they all had their own stations. Uh, they were making just wonderful, wonderful art. And I was so mesmerized by it. And uh, as the day wore on, I sat there all, I just watched. I was totally entrenched, uh, entranced with this. And uh, before you know it, the security guard came in and he said, sir, uh, we're closing the museum in about 10 minutes. I can walk you out. So I said, okay. Uh, so as we're worming our way through the exhibit, 
galleries and making our way towards the exit, the security guy says, well, you know, we started talking, where are you from? Are you a, an American Indian? I said, well, uh, I'm really nothing. I'm just who I am. Um, and, uh, you know, we just talked, where are you from? I'm from Arizona, you know, this, the, that kind of stuff. But um, as we were going through the museum, he said, so how did you like uh, what you saw today? And as we're walking along, I, I was just deep in thought. And after a, uh, a while, I turned to him and I said, you know, I think I finally found my calling in life. And uh, so I went back home um, and I just started reading everything that I could on glass art, glass history, glass technology, glass artists, anything and everything that I could get my hands on. And, um, and then I just went to doing it. Um, I started to visit other studios asked a lot of questions uh, and uh, I learned just by experience, just by experiencing things. So over time, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, go to Pilchuck Glass School in Washington State, which is probably the best uh, glass, uh, glass art school in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so that was where I really took off. You know, the, the, the trip to the museum in Corning was me getting on the tarmac. Uh, but when I went to Pilchuck, man, I, I was taken off. You know, I was picking up speed and I, I just flew. I just started to fly. Uh, and I came back home and I started to learn how to do things. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, when I'm at art shows or if I'm doing glass demos somewhere, people ask me, are you self, are you self taught? And my usual response is, no, I can't teach myself something I don't know, but I am self learned. So uh, I use that just to get people to think about the potential that we all have uh, outside of our classrooms, you know, um, we do work in the classroom on, an, on that academic level, but that's only one facet of your life. You have so many opportunities, you know, out there um, that if you really have a deep passion for something, you just got to go out there and, and get it done, you know, go out there and learn, go out and do things on your own. Uh, you know, uh, your teachers are there as resource people but you are your own leader, you know? You are the one to determine where you choose to take yourself in this life. And for me, glass was the passion, it still is. Um, so I've, you know, I've done a lot with it. There's much more that I can do. Uh, so that's where it all started. And um, I just, I love doing it. Keeps me healthy, keeps me sane. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. How do you okay. think your, like, how do you think the Hopi community has used, like, glass blowing? Like, how? The implementation of glass blowing in the whole community, how do you think that's affected the people? Okay, Lexi, right? Yeah. Yeah, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> uh, like I said, you know, there, there are a lot of things in this world that, that we can pursue if we have that desire and the compassion, but there are uh, situations where people just aren't into it. You know what I mean? You know, you, you see something and uh, a lot of people are hesitant to, to even try. And unfortunately for me, that's been my experience with my own people. Uh, I've been offering apprenticeships to younger Hopi people 
which is a little bit different because when I tell people, you know, if you really want to learn this, just show up, you know, that's what you got to do first, is just show up. And it's been at least 15 years that I can think that, you know, I've asked people if they wanted to learn. Uh, I've had a handful of people give it a try, but nobody's ever committed. So finding apprentices out here is very, very, very difficult. Uh, I have yet to find a committed individual. Um, and I even tell them, hey, look, I'm not going to charge you for my time. I'm not going to charge you for materials. I'm not going to charge you for the, for the fuel or anything like that. All I want you to do is learn. Um, but the only thing that I add to it is that uh, you know, I'm a shoestring operation and I can't pay you uh, for assisting me. But once uh, you've learned how to work independently, you're welcome to come here and produce your own work. And I will not take a cut of what you derive from your efforts. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm making an offer that I feel is very, very generous to people, but I've never had a serious taker in all these years, which is, uh, you know, it's a little bit disappointing, but uh, one thing that I would hate to have happen is to kick the bucket and not have anybody blowing glass out there. Because if that happened, all this stuff is just going to gather cobwebs. Nobody's going to be using it. So I'm hoping that someday, you know, someone is going to, uh, you know, show their face at the door and just want to work and learn how to blow glass. So it's, it's right now, it's difficult to get uh, anybody. Now, why? Well, there could be a number of reasons, you know, uh, glass, glass art, hot glass art, especially is very intimidating, something that you can't learn in a day. Um, you just have to grow with this stuff. Uh, so I hope the situation improves one of these days, but uh, I'm not going to worry if that doesn't happen. I'll, I'll accept that and just keep on moving. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, and the other thing too, I, I think I might've mentioned this already, but any of you are certainly welcome to disagree with me on some points. Okay. Ramson, we have another question from Emily. Her question is, what are some projects you hope to do in the future? Uh, oh boy. Uh, I think I'd, uh, I'd like to try different materials, uh, different types of glass that have a slightly different chemical recipe to them to give you uh, a more varied effect in terms of the colors and the textures. Uh, I want to express my own culture even more than I do today. Um, and that's what I'm blessed with is I come from a culture that's very, very rich in history and tradition. Our, our values and our belief system is fairly strong today. So I still um, have a lot of things in mind, but uh, I learned one time from another more experienced artist uh, that told me one time, they said, Ramson, don't make projections. Uh, when you start to make projections, all you're doing is you're setting yourself up for disappointment. So I just go into things um, with an open mind. Um, just go in there and grow. You know, in, in Hopi, we say you grow with things, meaning you become more experienced with them. Um, and you take these things into yourself, it becomes a part of you. Uh, so I, you know, in terms of projects, um, I'm going to let that happen as it appears at my doorstep. Uh, 
But, you know, the, the only thing about what I do today is I have a glass blowing studio. Um, and with glass art, you're limited to the size pieces that you can do uh, by the size equipment that you have. If you have a large furnace, you can do large per, uh, pieces. If you have a small furnace, you're limited in size because if you think of um, a furnace uh, uh, in, and a chamber with an opening uh, and the opening to my furnace chamber is approximately 12 inches in diameter. So the largest piece I can produce from that is about 10 inches because you need at least an inch buffer. Uh, otherwise you'd be building a boat in a basement. So you are constrained by certain techno uh, you know, technology and things like that. So um, if I wanted to go bigger and just more varied, I'd need larger equipment. That equipment would need to be more sophisticated. And in order to do something that's, that's large, you need one or more assistants to to put it all together. So I have another question. This one's from Victor. His question is, who are your favorite glass blowers and are there specific regions of glass blowing that you admire? It's all great. Um, everybody produces what they're connected to. Um, my glass guru is a glass blower in, in Santa Fe by the main name of Patrick Morrissey. He runs a, a studio that's called Prairie Dog Glass and they offer classes, but he does a lot of organic uh, forms and he incorporates wrought iron work into his, uh, into his glass blowing. Uh, he's great at what he does. Another glass artist in um, uh, Santa Fe is a lady by the name of Elodie Holmes. Uh, she has a studio called Liquid Light Glass and she does these wonderful, wonderful uh, pieces of, of blown glass. Uh, these people are worth Googling. Um, and then uh, I have two really good friends in Santa Fe who work at Prairie Dog. One is uh, a member of uh, the Okeowinge Pueblo uh, his name is um, uh, Robert Spooner uh, or Mar Robert Marcus. We call him Spooner. <laughs> and uh, Ira Lujan is another Native American artist. Uh, he's a member of the, the Taos community in northern New Mexico. And then Tony Hohola is another Pueblo member from the Pueblo of Isleta, south of Albuquerque. And then there's myself. Um, so we tend to congregate there to do our work. So Native American glass artists are few and far between yet, but it is a growing community. Uh, another very well-known uh, Native glass artist is a guy by the name of uh, Preston Singletary, uh, who is uh, up in the Northwest coast. Uh, and another one, Dan Friday. Uh, these are all people who do work that very, uh, they do really expressive work in portraying their own cultural heritage. It's great. Um, so those are people that I admire. Uh, I admire uh, apprentices or students who take classes in glass blowing uh, because um, when I when I conduct a class in in glass blowing, uh, the first thing that I tell my apprentices is that. Uh, this class really isn't about learning how to blow glass, you know. This class is all about learning how to overcome fear. Because you're going to have a fear of the heat. You're going to have a fear of getting burned. You're going to have a fear of failure, uh, a fear of miscommunication. Uh, you know, there, fears are just, you know, piled up mountain high at the get-go when you, when you start to learn this. And someone who's willing to, uh, you know, go through the, the gauntlet in the hot shop, uh, those are people that I really, really admire. Um, people who are just starting out, but, you know, they're, they're willing to, 
to take that chance. Ramson, uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat about the connection between your poetry and glass blowing. Uh, and um, uh, let's see if we can find one. Um, for example, um, Daniela asks, where does the inspiration for your art, both poetry and glass come from? Is there anything specific that you aim to communicate? But there are lots of questions about the connections. Between poetry and glass art? Yes. They're, to me, they're both expressions of your soul and your spirit. Um, they're, they're expressions of how you choose to view the world, how you choose to view life in general. Um, how you choose to grow as a person, um, how you choose to become Hopi, because that's something, that's a value that we have in our culture. Um, in, in our culture, we're discouraged from referring to ourselves as Hopi, because in our culture, uh, we define a Hopi who's someone, anyone, who is spiritually and morally pure. If you're spiritually and morally pure, you're Hopi. So it doesn't matter what ethnic background you come from. It doesn't matter wh which religion you choose to follow. Uh, the bottom line is, if you're free of sin, if you're a perfect human being, you're Hopi. So I can't call myself Hopi. You know, I, I'm working toward it. And um, the arts help me with that. Writing poetry helps me with that. Uh, because for me personally, I'm uh, using the arts to try and grow into becoming Hopi. Uh, some people may play soccer. Other people may play basketball or tennis or, you know, go ice skating or rollerblading or, you know, whatever you choose to do. If it's helping you to become a better person, you're becoming Hopi. So, it, you know, with, with that word, it, you know, people throw that word around loosely out here uh, because um, an anthropologist generally will define a Hopi as someone who lives in Northeastern Arizona who uh, lives in a matrilineal, matrilocal society, who speaks the Utu Shoshone and Aztecan language, who adheres and follows a certain uh, philosophy, um, who expresses themselves in certain types of arts. Uh, a cultural anthropologist would, would define a Hopi as that. Now, the Hopi Tribal Council and the Constitution uh, define a Hopi as someone who is at least one quarter Hopi by blood and someone who can trace their ancestry to the original membership roles uh, that the Hopi people had during the first census for them in 1934. Uh, the Hopi tribe does not require me to speak the language, to adhere to Hopi values or beliefs, uh, to hold residency here on the reservation. So they're very loose, uh, but the traditional definition of a Hopi is someone who is spiritually and morally pure. So I use that idea to express myself in these different art forms. Um, and probably for my poetry, uh, the poetry a lot of times is about the real me, the real experiences, the everyday stuff. Whereas uh, when I get into glass art, I'm looking for the ideal, the ideal life, what we choose to believe in, uh, what we choose to pursue for ourselves. And basically for me, uh, I remember being at um, a high school class at Idlewild Arts Academy in Southern California a couple of years ago. I spoke to a senior history class and one student asked me, what do you see your purpose as li in life? And I said, 
I believe that my purpose in life is to share my life with others. So I do that through the arts, either through poetry or through glass art. I hope I answered the question. Some, I, I have a tendency to digress every so often. <laughs> So we have another question. What has been your favorite piece and what was the inspiration behind it? My favorite piece? Um, I could answer that one in one of two ways. The first way would be, I haven't made it yet. And the other response would be, they all are. Because as I mentioned earlier, the pieces that I create are my children. I help to bring them into the world. So how can a parent have a favorite child out of many? They're all, they're all my favorite. They came here uh, for a purpose. I brought them to this world for a purpose. And the purpose of my children, my art, is to go out into the world and help to heal people. Right, another two-part question from two different people. Um, did you feel intimidated when you started working with glass and how did you deal with any challenges or frustrations that came about? Um, and then from there, has um, your feelings changed or evolved over time with glass blowing? Okay. May, may I make a request here? Can we uh, not have any two-part questions because I have a one-track mind. My brain can only handle one question at a time. <laughs> you want to just give the first part again, Emma? Yeah. Yep. All right. So first one is, who, did you feel intimidated when you started working with glass? Absolutely. I felt intimidated on my first day of kindergarten. <laughs> I felt intimidated uh, the day I joined the track team. I felt intimidated my first day in junior high school. I felt intimidated probably 500 million times in my life so far. And yes, I was intimidated by glass art. But if I let that intimidation dominate my life, um, I don't know where I'd be. I'd hate to imagine where I'd be. So um, I, you know, I just suggest to people, uh, hey man, uh, if you have a dream, pursue it, go for it, you know. But on the other hand, I always make the suggestion that always make sure there's water in the pool before you jump in. So yeah, intimidation, bring it on, you know? All it means that is that I'm gonna grow from that. Next the question. Second <laughs> yep, second part. Um, how have your feelings changed or evolved over time with glass blowing? Uh, they've changed and evolved. Um, simply to the fact that I can look at pieces that I did 10 years ago and see what I'm doing today. And I, I for sure see definite growth, um, progress. And, you know, I, I use that to gauge uh, my own growth in, in a variety of ways. You know, um, I see it to, as a mirror to, to look at my personal growth, my professional growth as an artist, but also my spiritual growth. Uh, yeah, you know, when, you, when you're in a funk uh, in life, uh, that generally means that you're kind of uh, getting off the path of something that's spiritual to a person. Now, please understand that uh, I'm not talking religion here. Uh, I'm talking about an inner strength, an inner peace that we all have, uh, an inner desire to grow. 
that that's what I refer to as a spiritual life. Um, and I'm continually in evolving, you know, I, I'm not done, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be 67 years old this coming Monday, next week, seven days from now, but I'm not ready to let an old person move into this body. You know, I, uh, until, until I let him in. Um, so, you know, to me, evolution is a lot of different things. I'm involving, I'm evolving in art. I'm in, I'm evolving in thought. I'm in, I'm evolving in what I feel is contributing positive things to the world. So I, I, I'm not, a, none of us are ever finished products. Uh, when you think of it, even after death, we're still not finished products because, you know, we're going to uh, be down there pushing up daisies one day. And, uh, you know, in our, in our cultural practices, we don't use coffins or caskets. You know, we bury people in their birthday suits into our mother, the earth, and eventually they become, you know, part of the soil. And at some point they're going to pop up as a flower. You know, that's just, that's just how the world works. Uh, so now nah, I'm, I'm not done evolving. I'm, I'm still, I'm still in the trench, man. <laughs> so our next question um, is asked, could you share some of your poems with us? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything in front of me. Um, you know, that's one thing I didn't prepare for. Uh, and I'm sorry. Maybe when you come back the second time to our classes again, you can bring, you know, bring your favorite poems to read. Along. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll bring you. Well, one of my favorite poems was written by a guy named Shel Silverstein. So do you want other people's poems or my poems? Oh, I, I was talking about yours. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was okay. Right on. Of course. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, who doesn't love Shel Silverstein, right, Eliza? The best. So, so some of my students may need to leave, and if that's the case, feel free to do so. Um, we will be seeing Ramson again out of respect for your time. Those of us who want to stay around and ask a few more questions can do that as well. Um, just a reminder that Ramson will be coming back to visit with us um, in, a, in, in a different way in November as well. So uh, any questions you had pending, you can ask them at that point. If anyone who wants to stick around for a little while longer and, and take um, so you can take more questions, have more conversation, can do that, okay? Yeah. And maybe it'd be a good, good time to uh, share uh, those uh, slides of some of my work. Oh, sh yeah, Emma, do you have that ready? Yeah, we'll just run through those. Okay, um, these are just a few examples of some of the work that I've done in the past. If we can uh, start out with the stained glass panels, the one in the center, actually all three of these are commissioned pieces. Um, the one in the center is uh, for in a home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And basically it tells uh, the life story of an individual from before birth uh, into uh, death and beyond. Uh, it's, uh, I believe about, the total was about 85 square feet of glass for this particular commission. It took about a year to do uh, from its inception to its installation. The one on the left uh, are archaic forms of butterflies in our culture, butterflies um, are symbols of, of beauty and innocence. Uh, there's a, a sunflower at the base there. Uh, the smoky base, the foundation there, uh, talks about uh, the unknown. And the potential life coming up are the two green rectangular upright uh, pairs on either side. And you'll see a, a young butterfly emerging from that. 
so that's um, people uh, coming into this world from uh, a prior world from this one. And then the one on the right is uh, what we call a salakmana. It's a butterfly maiden. It's a kachina figure, uh, uh, one of the many kachina figures that we have in our culture. So if we go to another slide, okay, these are blown pieces. Uh, uh, part of the thing about Hopi culture is um, where I come from, uh, boys, males uh, are prohibited from making pottery because we believe that's a woman's art form. So I never got uh, involved with working with clay. So I turned to glass uh, as a way to buck the system. And uh, the one on the upper left uh, is part of what, what I call the swirling stone series. It's all earth oriented. The one on the lower left is a Siketki form of pottery. And that's a classic form that dates back to about the 1400s. But again, it's all earth oriented um, with the emergence from the lower world according to the Hopi mythology. The one in the center is teardrop with a blossom on the side and that depicts snow. Uh, and then the one on the right is the serenity uh, that's encased in the chaos around it. So the spherical piece is the serenity. It's nice and uniform, it's calm. And you see all the turbulence in, in the bowl section of it, just movement. But it, they're, they're all earth oriented. Okay, so if we go to the next one, uh, these are called spirit figures. I got this idea from looking at prehistoric rock art. Uh, the Holy Ghost panel in uh, Horseshoe Canyon, Canyon, which is in uh, Canyonlands National Park in Utah, has a stretch of this canyon called uh, Barrier Canyon. And in this canyon, you see these prehistoric rock art figures that date back to about 950 AD. Uh, and the Hopis do have a strong connection to these images. So what I did was I, I took the basic form of the history of it and just uh, tra did a translation into glass. So the glass in the, the work that I do and the colors all are symbolic of different ideas in different cardinal directions. Okay, enough said. Don't applaud, just throw money. <laughs> Well, before we uh, before we say goodnight, Ramson, um, we do want to remind people that you are a working artist and you do have pieces for sale. Uh, and um, and we also want to point out that uh, you have some pieces that are going to be included in an exhibit on native glass uh, artists at the um, Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. And there's even a book. Uh, that's being published uh, as the uh, as the catalog, uh, and so I'll see if I can share my screen. Uh, let's see. Yeah, see, I found out about this book about fifteen minutes ago. <laughs> well, you told us about oh, the book wow. last week, but uh... that's, that's that's one of uh, Spooner's pieces. That's so a great the, cover. Yeah, it's a, the covers. The cover is amazing. That's we agreed so though that the title was a little uh, underwhelming, but the but the contents look like they're they uh, promise to be pretty exciting. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty nice. It is <laughs> beautiful cover. So the yeah. book's not that book's not out yet, but you can pre-order it. Um, and uh, oh yeah, Emma has put the um, has put link together. there in the chat, so that's great. Uh, and we can also share uh, Ramson's website with people, so mm -hmm. that if you do want to be in touch with him about pieces, um, you can do so. Yeah, you know, I encourage each and every one of you to communicate if you wish, uh, if you have just uh, questions on an individual level. You're certainly welcome to email me 
and I'll get back with you and try to uh, continue a conversation with all of you uh, as uh, much as I can. But I am hoping we're going to have a second visit down the road sometime. Yes, we are. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I appreciate everyone taking the time to join the group tonight. Um, you know, it just, it just makes me feel happy. Well, we really appreciate you being with us, Ramson. All um, right. So the, did you want to share your screen with the, with the links or how are you going to do that so that we could all see them briefly? Okay, there's my email address. Um, I know hardly anybody does this anymore, more, but you're certainly welcome to write a letter. You know, let's see how your penmanship is these days. <laughs> Okay, now just, just as a note, I really enjoy handwritten letters. Let's not forget that, you know? There's nothing like a handwritten letter in the mail. There's nothing like I'm a handwritten letter. I'm still getting them from my dad. He still sends me handwritten letters. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's so rare now, you know, that when I get a handwritten letter in the mail from anyone, Obviously, he's, he's been writing to me almost once a month, but yeah. it is pretty amazing to get letters in the mail. It's just yeah. so, so rare. Oh, and today is uh, Indigenous People's Day or something like that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was actually going to ask this question, you know, at the beginning of the uh, talk, what your thoughts are, just to share anything you felt comfortable sharing about what your thoughts are on the... Um, the positive movement in the right direction we're seeing from some and the end of that from others who continue to still want to use Columbus Day, um, even public school districts. I just wanted your thoughts. Well, um, I guess, uh, well, one thing that, that I really don't have any problems with sharing with you is that uh, uh, I'm in a recovery program, 12-step program. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, uh, but um, I've learned how to, uh, I'm try I don't try to judge too much because I know I'm a little messed up myself, <laughs> uh, but there's, there's a, a good side and there's a not so good side. Uh, I'm, the, I am grateful for Christopher Columbus because if I didn't know about him, I wouldn't know the dark history that this country is founded on. Um, the, the more I look at American history specifically, uh, the more I come to understand that there is probably 80% of American history is not written down anywhere. It's not discussed. It's, it's a subject that no one likes to sit down and talk about. Uh, people are intimidated by that topic uh, for one reason or another. Uh, my feeling about this is we do need to acknowledge what happened in the history of this country to native peoples. Uh, one thing, though, is um, uh, sometimes people will, in these discussions, they'll say, you know, I want to say I'm sorry for what we did to the Native Americans. And I tell them there's no need to apologize because you didn't do anything. It, that happened several generations ago. It happened many generations ago. ago those people back then need to be accountable for what they did. But why should we carry the guilt of something that we did not have a part of? As long as we communicate, 
as long as we understand each other as people, not as ethnic groups, not, not according to your economic or social status or anything, but just as plain old human beings. Uh, that's something that we can do. Now, there are a lot of good books uh, that are being produced now on Native American history that you don't see that in, in the typical American school system. Uh, I remember uh, in the third grade, uh, you know, the, the social studies thing for us was Arizona. And I, I remember about one paragraph being dedicated to Native people's place in Arizona history, uh, which is, it's very, very disappointing. Um, I really enjoy talking about history because the history that that I've inherited is traumatic. Um, and the only way that I can undo that trauma is to put it out on the table and talk about it and come to terms with it. Uh, most people thankfully have an easier time with that than other people. Uh, some people I've, I've found are not willing to look at that. Um, in, and there are a few people that I know who will pretty much deny uh, the events that happened in, in our history. Uh, so, you know, I'm encouraged by younger people today because uh, they're more aware of what's happening in, in life today. Uh, I know older people than myself who are still pretty close-minded about a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, uh, all, it, all it does is it, it builds up resentments in us, you know, whether how we were treated and, and everything. And as long as we're, we're silent about these issues, nothing's, nothing positive is gonna happen. Uh, there's, uh, there's a really good book that I, I recommend to high school students. It's a book uh, called the, the Real All Americans. If you got a notepad or something, write this down. The title of the book is called The Real All Americans. Um, it's written by uh, a writer for Sports Illustrated. Her name is Sally Jenkins. She wrote this book. And it, it talks about uh, the founding of the first Native American boarding school in the state of Pennsylvania. It's called Carlisle Indian School. And in that book, she addresses and talks about why the school was set up in the first place, which is the basic philosophy of that school was to kill the Indian and save the man. And that's the root of Native American education here in this country. So she talks about how children were taken from their homes, from their reservations, uh, some were kidnapped, how they were brought to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, how the education system, and we're talking in the late 1800s into the early 1900s, uh, how uh, children were indoctrinated into mainstream American culture. Uh, and, you know, the, and the fun part of this book is that uh, this is the school where they introduce American football to these Native American students from a variety of tribes. And, uh, and it's interesting because if you're familiar with Pop Warner, Pop Warner, he does play a part in this whole thing. It's a, it's a cool book. Uh, I'd recommend it just for fun reading. Uh, and, and you're gonna learn a lot from it about Indian education policy in the late 1800s. That's pretty much the, the core of the book. Right. And I could probably rattle off some more, but uh, they don't come to mind at the moment. All of my students are gonna have an option to do for the first couple of weeks of next term, uh, an optional book to read. So I'll put these, the books you just wrote down, I'll just put some new books on a list, including cool. that. Uh, and then uh, I like the book, Drifting Through Ancestor Dreams. Oh yes. Yeah, that yeah that's, that's that's a book written by, uh, 
a well-known poet as I, I, you know, I think he's being hyped up, but his name is Ramson Lamutuwaima. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, that's his claim to fame, I think. But he has other books out there too. I'll, I'll, I'll add the other ones you sent to me by email too. I think there was, there was one specifically on Hopi culture and history and a few others that. Yeah, there's, there's a good handful. <laughs> Uh, on just Native American history in general. Uh, they're, they're not pretty, but it's real. Well, Ramson, we should, we should probably say good night at this point, but we're so happy that you were with us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I enjoyed every second of this. It was, fantastic. It was a fantastic conversation, and I'm glad that we got to so many of the questions. Right. And everybody feel free to email me with your responses as you know, I want to see if um, I did a good job here tonight. You did. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ram. Not, I pray. Thanks all of you for joining me tonight. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Good night. Thank good night. You. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Hannah. Yeah, I was just gonna, going. Um, it's going good. Um, I th found your artwork really cool because I'm writing an essay about um, a poem by Joe Harjo called Directions to You. And she talks about like the themes of like finding light in the darkness and um, 